those who don't know uh, Mo, and, and you all should look up her work, it's incredible. She's got a huge body of work, uh, writing, as well as films. And Mo also has made history in Germany as the first Afro-German presenter on German TV. So Mo, I mean, could you talk to me a little bit about what was the path that brought you to that work? Well, uh, first of all, to be the first Afro-German presenter in Germany, if you look at me, uh, you see I'm not that old. So I, what's wrong with Germany, you know? <laughs> That might be the first th uh, thought uh, you would have because um, it was in 1997 to, or 96 to be uh, the first Afro-German on, on German television. So you can see I didn't have role models. Yeah, there were, was nobody uh, with, a, with a black color that I could look up to. And it was a really very strange feeling for me to be the first Afro-German on, on German television. And uh, because a lot of racism also uh, came through, they were writing um, to the production company, how dare you uh, put a black person on television like that? And all these things happened. So uh, it was really very thrilling. I can remember um, a friend of mine, Brandman Okpaku, she made a, a, a film uh, uh, about Dresden, a woman, Afro-German woman in Dresden, uh, who was looking for her, uh, for her mother. So she gave me the film and I think I was about 40 years old. She gave me the film, I looked at the film and in the middle of the film, all of a sudden I start to cry. Why? Because I, the first time in my life I saw in the main role an Afro-German person on TV. So this was like, wow. And I was crying like half an hour, really deep cry. So yeah, well, in Germany, it's a bit different than in the US. <laughs> You've spoken in some other interviews about your own personal family history as well and how that brought you to some of your more recent work around racism. Is that something you would want to talk about? Oh, yeah. I mean, what is very unusual that I have um, family um, who have been to the Nazi SS. So my grandmother, she um, was working for the Nazi SS as a class one writer. And um, well, in the end, she raised me. So how, how did that uh, uh, come through? So actually when my mother, when she uh, was pregnant with me, she told my grandmother, so I'm pregnant and yeah, the baby's going to be black. So, and my grandmother, she answered, um, okay, then I'm going to jump in front of the tram. I'm going to kill myself. That's what she said. So I don't know, this must have been a, a very horrible moment for my mother. But um, in the end, my grandmother, she didn't kill herself. So she waited. And then she saw me and, well, she raised me. I don't know. She was my port in a storm and um, uh, she raised me. And this really gives me um, the strong uh, being confident of, about uh, people, no matter what they went through, what they experienced in their life. I mean, she has been experiencing um, the, the Nazi time, like 12 years of Nazi terror, indoctrination, of anti-Semitism and all these things. And actually, I think her brain must have been really twisted. Yeah. And in the end, she saw me and she said, it's all mine. <laughs> So, and yeah, and then she raised me and um, this worked. So that helps me to be confident, to be open-minded uh, about talking with other people with other opinions. Well, and that open-mindedness has taken you some pretty amazing places. And we'll, we'll talk th about that a little bit more. But I wanted to ask you, you know, you mentioned earlier when you were talking about your path to becoming the first Afro-German TV presenter and how that, that was really challenging and there were no mentors. And, and when you were in that role, you received a lot of public death threats, like very, you know, very public and, and I imagine very, very frightening. And I was wondering, do you think that your experience of being targeted in that way 
Was it, was it at all different uh, as a woman? Do you think that the reaction might have been a little bit different had you been a man? And, and how did you kind of experience that intersection of racism and misogyny in that work? Well, of course, as a woman, you are not that strong. You don't have muscles and you can't really fight back. And that makes it very, very easy for people who are full of hate. So, I mean, most of the time they were writing. So anyway, um, that wouldn't have made a difference. It's, I think it's very important uh, for the man to be stronger uh, from, from the physical side. Mm -hmm. And that's why, of course, um, the first step of being violent against other people, even with, with words, is more easy for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. do you, and do you think that um, you know, your experience as a Black woman in, in Germany, has it given you you know, particular insights, like when you're interviewing people, when you're having these conversations that you've had also through your work, um, you know, with people who hold very different and very troubling and very racist views. Do you think that that, that experience has given you some, some particular uh, point of view that helps you in that? I think my, my whole life helped me everything, everything, even the, the chat with the old lady who's my neighbor or um, a chat in the bus, everything uh, helped me. But, you know, I have to say this uh, because my first, or not my first, but my, my second and my largest um, TV host program was an erotic show. So that is also different, you know, as a, as a black woman uh, having a show in uh, with the topic erotic and sex and talking about erotic and sex. So, um, this might, uh, might have happened because, yeah, they, they could have the imagination, oh, a black woman, yeah, she can talk about erotic and sex, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is also, I don't know, maybe that is already a little bit ra racist. Mm -hmm. And I thought, would they give me a news? Could I be a, a news anchor woman at that time? Never, never, never. So, but now that this has been changed, I know, um, maybe two or, or three people who are working in this news field with an um, Afro-German background, but that's all, not more. So, but yeah. at that time, yeah, they started with topics that uh, were mm, um, more easy for people to understand why they chose a black woman. I want to talk right now and move the conversation a little bit to some of, I think, your work that's maybe a little bit more well known in North America and, and this is work on, on the film The Aryans and some of the projects where you've done where you have actually yourself physically gone uh, into protests and, and neo-Nazi rallies and KKK events mm -hmm. and really directly confronted uh, people who hold very racist views. Could you talk a little bit about what moved you to take on that project and what gave you the idea to begin that work? Well, first of all, I thought um, about the, the term Aryan. Yeah, everybody knows the term Aryan uh, is tall, blonde, and blue-eyed. Yes, but that's not true. You know, that's what the National Socialists told the Germans at that time. And still, we don't question this term. And still, it's, yeah, almost everybody uh, uh, thought is tall, blonde, and blue-eyed. And my research said, this is not true. So actually, actually, Iran means land of the Aryans. So Iran, in Iran, yeah, those people are the Aryans from their history. And even if you go there now, when you take a taxi in Tehran and you go downtown and you say, hey, I'm from Germany. And then they say, oh, I'm Aryan too. They don't know that the Germans are no Aryans. That is so, so strange. And then of course, I'm like the, counterpart Aryan and on the other side people with a with another color so of course I was uh, a target and um, yeah they wanted to kill me there were a, a, was a group called um, white Aryan rebels a band and they were singing a song this bullet is for you Mo Asuman and with this song well uh, almost every uh, neo-nazi in Germany knew my name and of course I was afraid of yeah, yeah yeah having these people in front of my house and that's why I, I um, 
went on to see who are these people? Who are these people? I can look in books, yeah, I can see some, some films, but I wanted to really meet them and get it out of my system that I'm um, the weak part and that I'm the victim. I, I didn't want to be a victim. I wanted to be active. Active meaning somebody's saying something to me and I, I still stand. And or somebody is trying to hit me, but I still stand. And uh, yeah, and that worked very well because in the moment of this confrontation, or maybe not confrontation, but in the moment of this chat, uh, something very magical happens. Yeah. So what did you find when you spoke with these folks? Oh, first of all, I found a lot of like tricks that they are uh, using to, um, to take away your humanity. Because what is normal um, that you are um, a human being. A human being wants to talk to other people. And that's normal. So, but when you talk to neo-Nazis, to racists or uh, anti-Semites, yeah, then, um, they, they, uh, they have like a, um, a circle of wheel and hate and they throw sentences inside, yeah. They say, yeah, hey, go back to Africa or your father's a gene hijacker, yeah. He took the genes of your white mother to uh, make his uh, race bigger. And you see, and the, the circle of um, hate goes on and on. And the normal reaction of a person is what? You jump into this wheel because you are angry. Mm -hmm. But if you are aware of what they are doing, if you totally know that they want to take you out of balance so that you jump into this wheel, then you can just sit there and they, yeah, they tell you the most hateful things, but I don't, you don't see them anymore. I mean, they are, they are people. And mm -hmm. if I would go there with hate, um, I, I think this would have been really, really hard, especially uh, meeting the Ku Klux Klan. If you go there with hate, oh no, then uh, that wouldn't work. So after a while, after many, many uh, uh, chats with racists, I thought, I don't want to be like them. They put me in a box and I put them in a box. Okay, what's what's next? Yeah, that, that, that'll be no change in life, no change for us uh, people. Um, but to go and um, go inside of your being curious on a person mm -hmm. changes the whole situation because when you're curious, you don't remember that you are actually afraid. And I'm, uh, I think also the other side, even though you can't say, after the chat, they are healed, cured, or whatever, right. uh, and there are no races anymore. Maybe not, but maybe they dream of you. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you've disrupted their thinking, that wheel of hate that they have constructed yeah. by having to, to mm -hmm. see you as a real person. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, you've done obviously quite a bit of work in Germany and in Europe, and then also you've done done this work in the U.S. with the KKK and groups there. Do you see, do you see really strong similarities between the way hate groups operate and and work, or are there are there differences that you've seen between them? You mean a different from Germany and U.S. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. North America to Europe. Well, you have freedom of speech in, in the US and that is of course different uh, because like that you can take and use all the symbols. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the US, you just, um, you wear a coat and you have these uh, uh, SS runes yeah, mm -hmm. on the coat. In Germany, it's forbidden of course to use the swastika SS runes or whatever uh, runes in, in this connection. So they, um, yeah, if they use it, uh, you can put them into jail. Right. So maybe so a little more covert, some like they- Everything is covered. And when I went to the rallies, I saw lots of people, um, they have like tape here, here and there and there and what's under it swastika, SS rune. So they're covered with these tapes yeah, and they uh, walk around. In the US, they would just walk around. 
Hmm. So when you when you reflect on these projects, and you know, and I'm thinking particularly about about the Aryans and this work, what is your your takeaway about the work that that we all need to do in terms of confronting white supremacy? Uh, and and I wonder a little bit about whether you see these these hate groups as maybe an extreme example, but that there is like a spectrum, right? Like of, of that racism that animates them that is a lot more mainstream. And what can, you know, what is sort of the role that we all have in, in taking that on? Well, if you see um, extremist or somebody who's uh, more in a shallow uh, uh, way of uh, being racist, for me in the end, it's the same because how can you, can you get out of this bubble if you uh, if nobody uh, is asking you something from outside you know i was talking to a, a ku klux klan member i asked him why do you burn a cross so that was my question from the outside into this uh, field so um and he said yes yeah, it's, it's for jesus for jesus because jesus went from darkness to light I said, but Jesus, um, he also loves black people, don't you think so? Hmm. And you could just see his moving, shaking body with the hood going like this. Yeah. And it was silent. He didn't really know what to say. So um, I had the feeling probably I was the first person who asked him this question. And we need to be more people asking these questions, not like I'm going into a dialogue and in the end, I want to be the one who has the better rhetoric, yeah? Mm. Go like, mm, I'm the better one. That's not the way. I think we have to go in this, um, yeah, open communication, ask questions, get to know people and yeah, okay, you have to help them a little bit. I know a lot of black people say, no, we are really fed up. We don't want to help them anymore. Please help us. That's true. And this is, of course, something uh, that has to be done. But if there are some strong people, maybe also older women, <laughs> older people who know democracy is so important. Yeah. So um, all these people who are strong and in balance with themselves hey please go out there and use this strength to to talk to people with other opinions i think that's so important we have to do that before we went live you and i were chatting a little bit about audrey lord who is somebody that uh at the frederick ebert stiftung we also recognized as part of women's history month because of course she has a really great connection to Berlin and had some some really amazing flourishing years of, of work and writing there. So I wanted to just invite you to talk a little bit about your connection with her and her work and yeah, and yeah. celebrate her a little bit. She's a role model, of course, and um, the Afro-German community uh, is really more or less based on her thoughts and the thoughts of Mea Yim and uh, they were very, very powerful. And the consciousness of being Afro-German is because of them. And I can remember, really, that's true. I remember uh, being with them in, uh, in a kitchen in Berlin Schöneberg, in some, some uh, place in Schöneberg. And we are talking about being Black in Germany. And that was in the 80s. Yeah, I can remember that. And um, to have a, a, an identity and to, to uh, get into this identity as an Afro-German, that wasn't very easy. You see how fragile this um, identity is. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning, that was really in the 80s, at the beginning, it was absolutely not allowed to bring people from the outside into this uh, very fragile community. And uh, Maya Yim, she has her own street now also. Oh, I didn't know that. That's really yeah, cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. We've <laughs> changed a lot, yeah. yeah <laughs> I mean, not me. There were other, other great African, Afro-German women who are so strong and changed a lot also on the streets, yeah. You know, in the context of Women's History Month, we've talked about your work as being really barrier breaking and all the ways that you have really charted that path for 
Afro-German women and, and for the Afro-German community at large and, and how, you know, how challenging that that's been. But I wonder, you know, could you reflect a little bit on whether you see yourself as a mentor and a role model for women, uh, for Black women and, and for other women who are coming up, um, you know, in through television and presentation and as filmmakers and, and as artists, really. And uh, what are your hopes for them? What are your hopes for the future? I mean, I think I'm uh, part of uh, um, the Black community and um, but I don't, um, I don't focus on, on black community so much because for me, everybody, um, we, I think we belong together. So maybe I'm a role model for other Afro-German women or women um, uh, in, in the world, uh, no matter which color they have. But I focus on, on the topic racism and everybody can learn about this topic. So it can be somebody from, I don't know where, in the US, uh, Great Britain, Germany or everywhere. So mm. Black Lives Matter for me, if I would do an interpretation would be more of, it's not only for us because the others, they, um, they try to push us away, but we include, yeah. So that for me is Black Lives Matter means that we uh, don't exclude others. So my work is actually for everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs>